our reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, and Genesis chapter 3. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing, and pain you will give with pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not allow to reach out of his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to, to guard the way. <coughs> Here ends the reading. As we continue this series on identity, we once again go back to Genesis. When we want to know who we are today, we got to go back to see how we were originally designed to be. And so we return to the Garden of Eden, to a time when humans were without sin, were without the natural disposition to even want to sin, and put to the test by God to see if we would truly follow Him or not. And that test came in the form of a simple command. It's pretty simple. Verses 16 to 17. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. And you might wonder, well, why this command? Of all the commands God could command, why this one? 
Why not one of the Ten Commandments? Why not the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. Why this commandment? Why did God create a tree and then command them not to eat from it? It all seems a bit strange. Well, this command is a test. is a test of their basic trust in God. Would they freely obey God or would they not? Now, some might ask, why even put man to the test? Didn't God create them in his image? Didn't he say that after he created them that they were very good? Why then a test? And this is key to understanding our identity. Yes, we were created in God's image. Yes, we were proclaimed very good. But we were not created perfect. What I mean is that we were created sinless, but being sinless is not the same as being perfect. To be perfect, that sinlessness would need to be tested. So what need to be tested? Well, being created in God's image means that we were created with a will. A will that is free to choose God or free to reject God. God will not have a forced love because there is no such thing as forced love. Love can only be free, which is why you not create us as robots or puppets. And thus, if we have a free will, we are capable of love, but we're also capable of hate. We're capable of doing what's right, but we're also capable of doing what is wrong. We're capable of good, but we're also capable of evil. C.S. Lewis has a famous quote in his book on mere Christianity. He writes, if a thing is free to be good, it's also free to be bad. And free will has made evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the very thing that makes possible any love or goodness, or joy, or power. And because we are created with a free will, it cannot be said that we are created unable to sin. In that case, it wouldn't be free. We were created sinless. That is true. But we were, created, uh, we were not created unable to sin. This free will needed to be perfected. And perfection can only happen through testing. So here's the test. Don't eat from that tree. That one tree. And we're left scratching our heads as to why this command. And honestly, it's not that hard of a command. I mean, you get it, right? It's easy. It's an easy command. Don't eat from that one tree. That is, that is it. And all of you who are parents know how easy some commands can be, and yet still not be followed. They are not told why. They can't eat from the tree. Just that if they do, they'll die. And God doesn't tell them why they will die. He doesn't say, the fruit's poisonous, and that's why I don't want you to eat it. <coughs> and that brings us to the essence of the command. You see, Adam and Eve knew why it was practical, why it was good for them to obey the command, because it'll poison you or something like that. Then they would, they would be obeying God out of self-interest. Well, I don't want to be poisoned, so I'm not going to eat it. But if they obey God, not knowing exactly why he's given this command, simply just because God commanded it, then they are truly obeying God just for God's sake, just because he is God. Tim Keller, in his study on Genesis, suggests that God is basically saying something like this to Adam and Eve. I want you to do something just because I said so. How many moms have said that, right? Just because I said so. Not because it immediately benefits you or is practical, helpful, and exciting. I want you to do something just because I am God. Thus, this one seemingly odd commandment contains the essence of every single commandment God has or will ever give. And now we turn to the actual test. Let's take a look at what exactly Satan does in the garden, how he tempts Adam and Eve, which is still how he tempts us today. His playbook hasn't changed. It's exactly the same. All right. First thing he wants to do is to believe that we have a right to judge God. That is the first attack Satan does. You, we, you and I have the right to sit in judgment of God. <coughs> Verse 1. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? <coughs> Did God really say that? What's Satan doing here is he's slowly being called to question the goodness of God and also God's right to be able to say these things. No. God didn't actually say that, did he? Really, from any tree? The trees that you are the one working? You're working this garden. He doesn't want you to have the fruit from your labor. Oh, that's terrible. And of course, Satan's exaggerating here. God didn't say any tree, right? He said that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Satan's okay with exaggerating and lying. What Satan is almost imperceptibly doing here is he's gently leading Eve to believe that God's command is something that she can and ought to judge. That she has the right to evaluate what God commands. Friends, sin does not begin when we do something wrong. Sin doesn't even begin when we think about, decide to do something wrong. This passage shows that sin begins much, much earlier than that. It begins when we assume that we have the wisdom and right to decide if we should obey God's command or not in the first place. Again, Keller has some great insights here from his study on Genesis. He writes, As soon as you begin asking, is this obedience to God really beneficial to me or not? Should I obey this or not? Then you have already disobeyed. How so? You are assuming God's place. You are not being neutral when you begin such questioning. Rather, you are already committed to the supposition that you can stand in judgment over the wisdom of God. So the first step in temptation begins not with, dis, not with disobeying his will, but with putting yourself in a position to judge the wisdom of his will. And Eve falls for it, which opens the door for Satan's next attack, and that is to call into question the very goodness of God. Verses 2 and 3. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Notice she says that not only did God command them not to eat the fruit, but now God said, don't even touch it, which, of course, God didn't say that. Eve is now beginning to replicate Satan. She's beginning to exaggerate God's command, extra, uh, exaggerate God's strictness to them. Yeah, we can't even touch it. You're right. This is bad. <laughs> she is beginning to take her place on the judge's seat. Verses 4 and 5. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good now that Satan has even a spot where she believes she can and ought to judge God, Satan gets to the very heart of sin, questioning the goodness of God toward us. And he straight out says, God has lied to you, Eve. You won't die. That is a lie. He knows something. He's got, to tell you. He's got a little secret he's keeping from you. He knows when you eat of it, you will be like him. And he is petty. God is jealous. And he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to be completely happy. He doesn't have your best interest in mind, Eve. He is keeping you from achieving your ultimate fulfillment. If you obey him, you won't be fully happy. Eve, what kind of God is this? How can you trust a God like that? This is what Satan is saying. This is what Satan said. This is what Satan still says. This is what Satan will say until he's completely defeated. This is what he does. These are the lies see that seep into Eve's heart and the lies that seep into our hearts as well. And verse 6 shows us that this classic two-prong attack on Eve worked, and it's unfortunately it still works today. And that two-prong attack is believing that we can sit in judgment of God and question God's goodness toward us. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, it was pleasing to die, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And now we see the visible consequences of the invisible choices she has already made to judge God's word and to openly question God's love and goodness toward her. 
Now, you know, that tree does look pretty good. And it's, uh, I can even get wise if I eat it. Why shouldn't I eat this? You know, if God's good, he, he'd want me to eat this. And if God's real, he, this is something he would want me to do. Again, Keller has a great insight here. He says, Genesis 3 shows us that sin is a deeper concept than just breaking the rules. Nothing could make that clearer than God's choice for the first command. He did not make his command, don't kill or don't lie. Those, of course, are moral absolutes that are put into the heart of every human being. Why did God choose instead such an arbitrary rule like don't eat of that particular tree? It shows us that the essence of sin is not keeping a rule, but rather it is trying to be your own God, your own Savior, your own Lord. It is seeking to be one to <laughs> judge. That is the very beginning of sin, even before you've decided, to, you've decided to break a rule. And the desire to be God's rival and to be like God has now passed to every human heart and informs absolutely everything we do, whether consciously or unconsciously, whether we are Christians or non-believers. And that brings us to the consequences of their decision, and their action. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now what's really surprising about verse 7 here is that it doesn't say... They ate the fruit, and then they died. Instead, it actually says their eyes were open. And they must have been thinking Satan was right after all. He said our eyes would be open, and we wouldn't die. And look at it, our eyes are open, and we didn't die. So was Satan right? Well, no. No, he was not. Yes, their eyes were opened, but not in the way they expected. And no, they did not physically die immediately, but death had now invaded everything, all creation in a way they had never anticipated. <coughs> so let's take a look at what it means with the opening of their eyes. See, they believed that they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they would become like God. And the tragic irony of this situation is that that's exactly what happened. They became like God by choosing to be self-sufficient, and sitting in judgment on God's commandments and goodness, they were very much acting like God. But instead of emulating God, they were impeaching God. They were kicking God out of the, off his throne. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is aptly named because Adam and Eve would have had their eyes open even if they had obeyed and did not eat from the tree. You see, there are two ways to learn the difference between good and evil through obedience and through disobedience. Just as there's two ways to know about a disease. You can be a doctor and study uh, a disease for your whole life, and you can know it. Also, you could be a doctor and get the disease, and then you know it as well. And they chose to learn through disobedience and infected themselves with a deadly disease known as sin. Their innocence was corrupted by their disobedience, and they were left feeling shame and guilt for all they had done, all they had become. You see, back in Genesis 2, chapter earlier, Adam and Eve were naked, and they felt no shame. All was good. Now, with the invasion of sin, their nakedness is distressing. They instinctually feel the need to cover themselves as trust and transparency began to fade away between the husband and wife. And also, toward their God, as we see in the very next three verses, 8 through 10. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And this is a classic response to sin. Let's hide from God. We don't want God to see what we've done, who we have become. And while today we probably don't go and hide in trees like Adam and Eve, we all have our ways of hiding from God when we do stuff that we know we shouldn't do, or we don't do stuff we know we're supposed to. And that could be just keeping our thoughts as far away from God as we can. It could involve skipping church. It could involve distracting yourself with a whole host of things. Whatever we can do to keep from thinking about our sin and guilt. And that's what Adam and Eve do. And why do they do it? Because they're afraid. 
Sin has changed everything. Before, they were confident, eager to walk with God. Like little kids who uh, run to the door when dad comes home from work or mom comes home from work. Now, the enemy are like rebellious teens who stay in their room, obeying their parents, fearful of punishment. And when God finally knocks at their door and says, are you there? We need to talk. Instead of fessing up, admitting what they did was wrong, seeking forgiveness, they instead show another classic response to getting caught. Blame others and self-justification. Verses 11 to 13. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Lord God said, the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. And I hate it. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. Actually, Adam also blames God. Did you notice that? It's because the woman that you gave me, <laughs> you gave me, God, that I hate. So Adam's suggesting, you know, listen, if she wasn't here, I wouldn't have sinned. Or maybe God, you gave me a better helper, I wouldn't have sinned. And of course, Eve does the same thing. She blames her actions on the serpent, not taking any responsibility for her free choices. Friends, human nature doesn't change. This is such a classic response to sin, getting caught. We do this too, as well, don't we? In our, in our, our not uh, best days, right? It's such a common reflex mechanism to just blame others and to justify your own behavior. And so we come to the verdict. Adam and Eve awaiting their punishment, which they already know what the punishment is. God already told them. It says, when you eat of it, you will surely die. That's the punishment. But let's read God's sentencing of the woman and the man, verses 16 through 19. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife <laughs> and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sword of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the dust. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. It must have come to a shock, as a shock to Adam and Eve that they didn't die immediately, because that was the promised punishment. Of course, what they probably don't realize is that death certainly did arrive that day in a much more comprehensive and pervasive way than they could ever have imagined. Again, one last color quote here. He writes, Physical death is only one vivid example of the death and disintegration that now comes to all human relationships and every aspect of human life. Nothing works right now. Everything falls apart. Sin leads to death, disintegration of every area of life. Spiritual, physical, Social, cultural, psychological, <coughs> So the biblical view of the world is that it is fallen and subject to death in every aspect. Sin has severed their lifeline with God. Spiritual deadness invaded their souls, and death and disintegration invaded all of creation. The immediate judgment passed on the man and the woman relate to this. It goes back to God's original instructions, right? His call for them to multiply and care for the earth. Now, both of, them, both of those are going to be much more difficult, childbearing for the woman and uh, working the land for the man. But what's most interesting as we close here <coughs> is that this section is not all about judgment. In fact, there is a lot to be hopeful for in the midst of the judgment. First is the fact that God didn't just wipe out Adam and He certainly had the right to do that, but he didn't. Second, God actually provided clothes for them instead. Verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them. Meaning he had to put to death other living beings to provide for them. Third. God drove them out of the Garden of Eden. Listen to these verses here. The Lord God said to the man, The man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life to eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed him on the east side of the Garden of Eden a cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now you might be wondering, well, why is this a good thing? Why, is, why would this be a good thing? They get drove, they're driven out of the Garden of Eden. Well, 
Many theologians believe that the tree of life here in some way confers on a person eternal life, but does it in whatever present condition that they are in. Certainly, God designed them to live forever, but he did not want them to live eternally in their sinful condition. So it was actually a good, merciful thing to restrain them from the tree of, of, of life until their sinful state is no more. And what is really interesting is that the next time the tree of life is mentioned in the Bible, so here we are in Genesis 3, the next time is all the way to the very end of the book of Revelation, the very last book, when paradise is restored and all who are with the Lord are called to eat from this tree when we are no longer in the state of sin. And finally, fourth, God's curse on Satan actually becomes our greatest hope. So the man and the woman weren't the only ones cursed that day. Verses 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock, all the wild animals. You will crawl in your belly, you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, hatred, between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Here God declares an all-out war on sin and evil. And when an all-powerful God does that, I like his chances, all right? Verse 15 tells us that a single <laughs> descendant of Eve's will one day utterly destroy the serpent. He will crush the serpent's head, which means to utterly kill it. But the verse also tells us that in the process of crushing him, he himself will suffer. The serpent will strike his heel. Now, who is this all about? God is speaking to us about a promise of his son, Jesus Christ, who would come as humanity's second Adam, our second chance to pass the test that we failed in the Garden of Eden. Did you know the very first thing that happens to Jesus after, when he begins his ministry, after his baptism, the very first thing that happens is Jesus was tested. And we read that testing today in a responsive reading. He was tempted by the same serpent, Satan, but unlike Adam and Eve, he did not fail the test. He didn't give in. Even though he was God, he never believed that he had a right to judge the commands of his father. He never questioned his father's goodness or wondered if his father had his best interest in mind. In short, Jesus obeyed where we disobeyed. But even here, that wasn't the final test for Jesus. That would come a few years later when he would be in another garden. And we actually have a picture of it right here. In the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was to be killed. This was Jesus' last hour, all right? I had a wedding yesterday. I always do this with every wedding. Before the service begins, I take a moment with the bride by herself, a moment with the groom by himself, and say, here's your last chance. I'm giving you one last out. You laugh, but the pastor I learned this from had a, had a bride take him up on the altar. Because it's so important, let's make sure that we are 100% in, not 99% in. One last out. This was Jesus' last out right here. He knew as soon as he was done praying, the mob was coming for him, he would be arrested, and everything would happen, and he would die on the cross, bearing the wrath of the sins of the world. And even here, with his last out, the ultimate test, Jesus bearing his soul to the Father, saying, is there any other way we can do this? And Jesus received a silent no. Jesus obeyed. And he said, not my will, but thine will be done. And so in a sense, Jesus did receive the knowledge of good and evil just like us, but in a very different way. He learned it through obedience while we learned it through disobedience. Which is why the, the author of Hebrews says this about Jesus in verses 5, 8, 9. Although Jesus was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Jesus learned obedience. And being made perfect... He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now you would have thought, well, Jesus was perfect before that, wasn't he? Well, this tells us Jesus, uh, he was made perfect through his obedience, through being tested with the freedom of will that he had just like us, because he was made like us in every way. Jesus was born sinless, but was tested. And when he passed that test, he was declared perfect. But amazingly, he wasn't declared perfect for his sake, he was declared perfect for our sake. Where we failed, 
Jesus Christ succeeded. And now through faith, when we receive God's free gift of salvation, Jesus' victory becomes our victory. His obedience is our obedience. His perfection is our perfection. Friends, our strength is not in ourselves. Our strength is that we have His victory, His obedience, His perfection given to us. That's the gospel. That is the very heart of Christianity. It's not about what we do for God. We fail that test and we fail it all the time. It's about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ who passed the test with flying colors for us. Next week, we'll take a look at the ramification of sin in our lives now that it is in the world. How it has warped and changed us for the worse. Sin and our identity, unfortunately, are intimately related. And without a proper understanding of sin, we will have no clue as to who we are. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we confess that we are weak in and of ourselves. That of our own free will, our own free choosing, we have disobeyed you many times, doing what we should not do, but also not doing what we should be doing. Father, we declare, we realize, we, your word shows us that on our own, we just can't do it. That we are now prone to sin, prone to wander, as we sang in the first hymn this morning. But we are so thankful, Jesus, that you came, took on our very human nature. That's what we uh, celebrate at Christmas. That you lived a perfect life. That you passed every test, including the two biggest tests being tempted by Satan, and then having the opportunity to say no to all the pain and hurt and the agony that would happen at the cross. You didn't because you wanted to obey God, obey your Father, and because you loved us so much. And we remember that and we give thanks for this one. Help us in the times that we are tempted by Satan to sit in judgment over your commands to question your goodness to us. Help us to realize that, the, that this is just the old Satan doing the same exact thing, using the same exact playbook he's always used. May we, like Jesus, turn to your scriptures and by the power of your spirit, remind ourselves again and again of the promises that we have in you. Help us to know that you give good commands because you are good. And now we can trust you. You do have our best in mind, even through the storms of life. We pray this in Jesus' name.